Christian is an adopted child of God. And it was to this truth that we gave our minds on last Sunday. And we saw just as legal human adoption proceeds by orderly steps, so also does spiritual adoption. For it is the result of the reading, the hearing, the preaching of God's Word. Then the work of the Holy Spirit working in our minds, enabling us to say, this I believe, and this we describe as effectual calling. And then not only an assent on our part, but in faith, reaching out to accept what God in Christ offers us. Then we find the experience of justification, where God regards us as if we had never done wrong. And finally then, we are children worthy of adoption into the family of God. But it is interesting to note that the Bible tells us not only of the fact of adoption, but it proclaims also what we know to be as the privileges of adoption. The shorter catechism has the question, what is adoption? And the answer many of you will recollect, adoption is an act of God's free grace whereby we are received into the number and have, all, have the rights of all the privileges of the sons of God. Not only being received into the family of God, but a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. Now, what are some of those privileges of adoption? Well, we find them perhaps explicitly stated by Paul in the Scripture which was ours last Sunday, that great passage from Romans 8. And I think that Paul's first assertion there as to the privileges of adoption is that by being adopted children, we are delivered from fear. He writes, you remember, ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. Now the question in the minds of scholars is, from what fear is it that by adoption we have been delivered? Many assert, of course, that it is the fear of judgment and of condemnation. And certainly this is a part of it. For if our trust is in Christ crucified and resurrected, then as it is written in God's Word, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who believe. But I think that Paul here has a different kind of fear in mind. I think when he speaks about deliverance from bondage to fear, he is thinking about being delivered from the fear which is the possession of all people who seek by their own merits and by their own means to make themselves acceptable in God's sight. Remember, this was the early time of the Christian church when there was still on the part of many the insistence that a man's salvation still depended to a great measure on a man's works. Now, this may not mean so much to us today, but in that day and time there were many who were conscientiously concerned about the salvation of their souls. And to do this, they adhered rigidly to the Jewish law with all its restrictions and with all its requirements. 
only constantly to discover that there was no complete fulfillment of the law. And being no complete fulfillment of the law, then there could be no assurance of salvation for them. And this brought dread to a man's heart. We find it as late as the 16th century in the life of Martin Luther, when he was a young Augustinian monk. And you remember how desperately he determined to convince himself of his own salvation. He began, you remember, by deciding, as the church taught, that salvation was in the main the outcome of good work. Now, what could a monk do cloistered in a monastery in the way of good works? Well, he found many things to do. Instead of fasting just one day as the covenant com or the law required, he fasted three days without ever a crumb to reach his mouth. Instead of using the meager bedclothes by which the body was protected during those cold nights, he cast off all the bedclothes and practically froze himself to death. And then he would look even at the simple garb of the monk and feel, well, maybe, maybe he wasn't poor enough. And he would discard all clothing that was his, save that essential for decency, but still he was unsatisfied and still he was afraid. Yet so desperately did he try that he said later, if ever there was a monk that could have been saved by monkery, I was he. Then you remember in fear and dread he decided on a pilgrimage to Rome because a pilgrimage to Rome could mean that a man could increase indulgences. A man could go to Rome and thereby trade, as it were, on the merits of the saints. If masses were celebrated at certain basilicas and shrines, if the catacombs were, were finished or, or were visited, if before the relics of the saints, the bar before which Judas supposedly hanged himself, this and that, if before them he would prostrate himself and venerate them, then somehow or other he could store up merit in heaven, and he did all that, you remember, only to feel within himself that somehow or other those other people didn't have any more merit than he had, that there was no superfluity there to be obtained. And you remember, in desperation, he climbed the Scala Sancta, the 28 steps there in Rome, the steps which originally were supposed to have stood before Pilate's palace. He didn't go up those steps to secure any merit for his own, for one climbed those steps on hands and knees with the assurance that if you did, then you would release some soul from purgatory. And though his father and mother were still living, his grandfather was dead and in purgatory, and so he climbed those steps on his hands and his knees, saying a pater noster at each step and kissing each one. And yet when he had reached the top and stood again to his full height, he felt within himself, this just isn't so. And he returned, you remember, to Wittenberg to engage in what the Roman Catholics described as penance to make full confession of sin, for this was necessary for salvation. Do you realize that he spent as many as six hours at a time in confessing his sins? And after six hours of confession, he would rise, but he had not gone ten steps before suddenly the mind, the memory recollected that here was a sin that had gone unconfessed. And if it was not confessed, it could not be forgiven. And if it was not forgiven, there was no salvation. And it was at this time in his life when Luther, you remember, turned in anger upon God when his whole nights were made miserable by those fiendish nightmares in which he dreamt that he was forsaken by God and in the hands of the devil, and salvation was a myth. Then you remember he was given the opportunity to teach Bible there at Wittenberg. To be a good teacher, he made a profound study he began, you remember, with the Psalms and came to the 22nd Psalm. And as he read it, 
It reminded him of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Here, word for word, was almost a picture of Calvary. Here in the Old Testament was the anguish of the New Testament Christ poured out. And Martin Luther began to wonder why it was that one who was sinless, one who was perfect, one who was right in every way had so to suffer. The only thing he could conclude was that somehow or other his iniquities, the iniquities of Martin Luther had been laid on Jesus Christ. And that Christ had paid the penalty for them. Christ was knowing something of the agony that was his. The truth came, you remember, when passing from Psalms to Romans, he came to the great declaration, the just shall live by faith. By faith in what? By faith in believing that what Christ suffered was what he should have suffered. But it was suffering in his stead, and if only he would believe it, and he believed it, his fear vanished a fear that was born of a desperate effort to win salvation for himself. Then came the peace, the realization that Christ had already suffered. By faith, all he had to do was to believe it and accept it. He did. I think it is from the fear of the realization that a man can never make himself right with God that we are delivered by adoption. Remember Bickersteth's hymn, Peace, Perfect Peace in This Dark World of Sin? You remember the first stanza of that hymn? Each of the first stanzas is what, or the first line rather, is what? It's a question. And the hymn opens, peace, perfect peace, in this dark world of sin. And what's the answer? The blood of Jesus answers peace, peace within. That's your peace, mine. The realization that no matter what you've done, no matter how ugly, how cruel, how terrible, how much deserving of penalty and punishment. This penalty has been undertaken and undergone by Christ. And there's peace within and deliverance from fear. Paul goes on to tell us that a second privilege of adoption is what? That we get a different concept of God. We get a different concept of God. You remember, ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received what? The spirit of adoption, whereby we cry what? Abba, Father. What mean these words to you? Is this gibberish on the part of the apostle Paul? You've read them a hundred times in Romans. What signify they to you, Abba, Father? Well, this is a double statement of the same word. Abba is the Aramaic for my father. And the words here are simply repeated, showing a certain intensity of feeling, showing a depth of relationship, showing a great understanding of who God is. You remember, this was the expression used by Jesus as Mark records it for us in the 14th chapter of his gospel, where you remember we have that scene in Gethsemane where Jesus now seeks, as it were, to align his will with the will of God, knowing now that the cross with all its agony is imminent, knowing now that if he wants to flee, he can flee, but determined that he won't. Mark tells us that in agony he said in the garden that night, Abba, Father, all things are possible to thee. In a sense, what he said was, Father, my Father, all things are possible to thee. And what Mark is here telling us is this, what 
that Jesus saw in God one who is a father, and one with a fatherly and a friendly heart, so that no matter what he's called upon to suffer, no matter the agonies that await him, since God is a father, and he feels that he's a father, then God will see him safely through. And if we are children of God, then God is more than just some distant being. God is more than the creator and the sustainer of the universe. God is more than the fashioner and the former of our human bodies. God is a father. And you can say unto him, Father, my father. And what does that mean? It means then that though you may not understand everything in life, you have enough confidence in God to believe that being a father, he is not mistreating you. He is not abusing you. He is not making sport of you. You remember Thomas Hardy, that cynical yet brilliant British novelist who lived in the latter part of the 19th century and died in 1928, constantly had in his novels the theme that God was here in the universe using you and me and all people as pawns and playthings, delighting in our sufferings, making things hard for us, you see. And you remember in his, perhaps, the most famous of all things he ever wrote, Tess of the Durbervilles, after describing the agonies, the disappointments, the frustrations, the heartbreaks, and the sorrows of Tess, he said what? The president of the immortals has finished his sport with Tess. This was what God was to him, just someone above us who delighted in making life hard for us, who somehow or other thrives on our sorrows, Someone who has about him the spirit of the fiend, who delights in another's misfortunes. Like perhaps we used to do when you were little, to find a fly and to take its wings off, and then watch its feeble struggles to fly. To Thomas Hardy, this is what God was like. But Paul says that if we know we are adopted children of God, then what? Then we cry, Abba, Father, Father, my Father, so that though you cannot understand everything that happens, you can at least bear it, accept it, and know that someday you'll see a reason and purpose. How many of you here? I'm sure at times must have felt that God was probably making sport of you. But is there a real father who would find fiendish glee in planning the sorrow of a youngster? Is there? You know there isn't, and I know. And as an adopted child, Paul says, we cry, Abba, Father, Father, my Father. And you trust him. This I'll have to finish some other time. Time do go. I don't know when, because we have baccalaureate sermon next Sunday. We'll get back to it. Paul goes on to speak of the inheritance of the saints. You ever thought what your inheritance would be in heaven? Paul says, if you're an adopted child of God, then what? Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And in the scripture that was read this morning, you remember Peter said what? It's an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, unfading so different from everything we have on earth. Then he ends it with the great statement. Now, all these things are yours. All these privileges are yours and mine, provided what? If so be we suffer with him, 